Cool. Our guest today on The Bridge, musician, singer, songwriter, producer, visual artist, Dan Wilson of Semisonic. We all remember Closing Time, now back after 19 years with the new EP, You're Not Alone. I know, Dan, that you did not go anywhere, but welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, it's really cool to think about the band getting back together, but you're actually in a different physical location, so... You had to pull, you know, John in from Minnesota, I think, and yeah. Jacob from New York, and you're now yeah. in L.A. Yeah, yeah, we're tri-coastal. It's crazy. I when J when Jake first um, moved to New York, I was very supportive and and of of the idea. This is a long time ago, and I also thought, oh, it's going to be fine. We won't complicate our lives at all. But now we're like, you know three times as complicated in our interactions, but it's, it's cool for, you know, you pandemic, have, everyone's completely, it doesn't matter if you live five miles away. Right. You actually recorded this though in your home. Yeah. 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 I, we set up, we have, um, um, uh, uh, basically a living room and, uh, our engineer, John Sinclair just made a miracle happen with, the. Uh, borrowed amps and borrowed microphones and and tolerant neighbors and uh yeah yeah we were talking about you having drilling next door do you ever get complaints um about your recording sessions I, you know you, uh, first of all i do anything i do that's loud where i need a studio i i there's so many real studios in la i just go there yeah i don't do those loud things in my house that much when i write songs in my house it's mostly at my piano or you know with a guitar or on a laptop so um, it just was a, uh, an unusual situation with Semisonic because we just had to find a way to set up all kinds of loud things in, at, at one time, you know. You know, that 19 year gap that you had was filled up with a tremendous amount of life yeah. uh, for you. And I, and I think that that's really a huge story about how, how you found your way back. Um, you have done so many co-writes that yeah. I was looking at the list and, and like I just started laughing because yeah. there are so many incredible artists that we love so much yeah. that you have worked with. Uh, your first co-write, however, was with your brother. Yes, Matt, my brother Matt and I learned, essentially learned how to write songs together. And he kind of, he kind of cracked the code first, I would say. He was the first one to write a couple of songs that didn't just sound like a bad Beatles song. Uh, or, or you know, a junior high school kid's song. He wrote a couple things pretty early on that were pretty great. But then when he started Trip Shakespeare, I think he really had figured something out. And, and those songs all had this like very finished kind of received, you know, it didn't sound like a work in progress. They were just done. And that was something that I learned from him on how to do that. I think that for you, the co-writing thing was partly, you know, an artistic urge, but also sort of as a sideline to Semisonic originally. Yeah, I, 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 I had this idea that, um, first of all, in Semisonic, I always wrote too, way too many songs. There was just no way to use all the songs. And, um, that, and, then, so, and, then, so, and then I had this idea that I could maybe use some of the extra songs for other people or some of that extra energy any any way I could use to write for other people. And um, I I thought it was just gonna be a, a kind of a sideline uh, for my for my band uh, work. But um, when the time came where I really, for family reasons, I had to stop touring all the time, um, I had kind of gotten the co-writing thing and producing for other people sort of rolling at that time. And it just kind of, naturally change it be turn you know change from my sideline to the main thing you know when you were working on this one of your early co-writes song that actually landed on the semi-sonic album was with carol king it's like why not just start at the top i mean that had to be yeah, why not? so daunting right yeah i was so daunted i was really nervous carol carol was a sort of a hero of my parents and she um they had they listened to carol king records when when we were all, my, my siblings and I were kids and and um so when by sort of happenstance I got this chance to write 
uh, uh, do a day of writing with Carol, of course, I was really, really excited. And I called my mom um, right away. I sent her an email, actually. I sent my mom an email about it. And my, uh, my mom emailed me back right away. If you're going to work with Carol King, you have to learn to write her first name with an E. <laughs> like I had, I had misspelled her first name, but I was so, I was super excited. And, and Carol was, I think Carol had had many times the experience of a nervous partner. So she showed me how to deal with a nervous partner who was me. Yeah. You know, uh, being emotional in, in that co-writing room, I think probably isn't a rare thing regardless. Uh, I love, there's a, a quote from Adele saying that you had her down on her hands and knees crying. <laughs> part of the co-writing process. What did you do to Adele? She's everyone's sweetheart. You made her cry, sounds, Dan. It just doesn't sound that fun in the retelling, but we had a lot of fun. It was very emotional writing with Adele, and she's very, very, um, she wears her heart on her sleeve in an amazing way, but, but she's also a, an amazing master of the craft. And she was, when I first met her, she was probably 20 when I first met her, and she was already an uh, incredible songwriter. So I... But yeah, like if you're, if you're doing it right, you have to be able to talk about the most sort of embarrassing or sad or infuriating thing and not, and not worry about being judged or picked on by the person you're with, you know, it's got to be safe. You know, you famously worked with the Dixie Chicks, co-wrote a bunch of stuff. And in fact, we're playing March March right now. Oh, great co-write for you were also playing Leon Bridges sweeter uh, oh you know and you go down the list Mondo Cosmo James Bay John Legend Josh Groban Steve Perry Jason Mraz Brett Denning Cold War Kids The Head and the Heart Weezer Andrew Bird Not a Surf Panic at the Disco Florence and the Machine Harry Connick Jr. Chris Stapleton My Morning Jacket Spoon The Secret Sisters Taylor Swift Mike Doty and this is just the tip of the iceberg uh, I think that the ironic thing here is that so many genres, so many different kinds of artists, and yet mm. the reason we had 19 years without Semisonic was because you couldn't find a way to write for your own band. <laughs> like, what is <laughs> Yeah. Like, really, yeah, I could, Dan? Yeah, I, could, I could do every style except for my own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about this. Um, you know, to me, it felt maybe like... Uh, this all started to change for you and maybe writing for your own band got a little bit harder because of the work that you did with Rick Rubin around your original solo album hmm. Free Life hmm. back in 2007. You started changing your approach to some of these things because of that mentorship. Is that a fair? Yeah, I think, um, I think uh, working with Rick, for me, Rick Rubin was like a, uh, a kind of a crash course in the lore of recording and how, like, how to make something direct, something so sonically and emotionally really direct. R Rick's huge strength is that he um, figures out a way for the people who he's working with to be themselves in a really, often really funny, or ridiculous way but really really just be themselves and wear their hearts on their sleeves and sonically he's also um uh really great at that the the, the records that rick has worked on over time have just they stood up they just sound great and i think semi sonics records uh sound great too but that was not because of me as much as the john and jacob's taste partly i would say and then the people we worked with. And, and when I did that long stretch of doing work with Rick Rubin, I partly was learning how to, how to make stuff sound great and real and kind of in your face um, for myself, like how to do that. And Semisonic, I, was, I wasn't responsible for that. I was just responsible for, ma for writing cool songs and like playing guitar, you know? And, and, and so it's almost like I had to, learn too much and get 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 too much of an inside view and then have enough time for that to kind of fade out and just be able to forget about that knowledge and just play the guitar and write a song for myself in that in that way that I did before without all that that lore and that knowledge and that Rick Rubin 
kind of like perspective. I kind of needed to get back into not having any perspective and that that's what worked for me. <laughs> Our guest today is Dan Wilson of Semisonic after a 19 year break back with a new EP. You're not alone and it's really great work and it's so, so fun to have new Semisonic music. Uh, we were talking about that 19 year gap and during that period of time, you never broke up with the band. Yeah, no, we didn't. This was always, it, it was just, you just didn't have new music. A couple times a year, you were sitting down and trying to find that semi-sonic song yeah. that was waiting in your guitar. Yeah, I, I, the guys and I, we stayed friends and in, 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 in one way it kind of muddled our messaging, you know, to the world. We just kind of ghosted. We just kind of like slipped off and didn't do it anymore. And uh, that's not even exactly true because we played you know, at least one kind of benefit every year, I think, just to get together. Like we'd find some cause and say, okay, we'll do it. We'll do your gala, you know, or we'll do, or we'll do a political fundraiser or whatever it might've been. Or like we did in 2016 um, and 17, we did a couple of shows that kind of commemorated Great Divide, our album, Great Divide and um, our album, uh, Feeling Strangely Fine. We always found, found some reason, some way to hang. Uh, yeah. So it kind of made it like, also, it, it sort of took a little drama away from it, but it sort of took also the kind of storytelling urgency of, um, you know, giving everyone a reason why we're starting again. Although everyone's still very curious because they, they kind of think we dropped off the face of the earth. You know? Yeah. I thought one of the things that was so interesting was that you found yourself trying to write songs for somebody else. All of a sudden, that semi-sonic voice came back to you when you were trying to write for Liam Gallagher of Oasis. Yeah, I had a, I had a really really inspiring uh, hang with Liam Gallagher from Oasis, and he is one of my favorite singers ever. I just love his voice, and I love the way he sings, and I love his I love his songs. He doesn't write a ton of songs, but I I, I really think he's a fantastic songwriter. So we were talking about writing some songs for him, and um, th then he flew back to the UK. And uh, I got inspired and I wrote like four, four songs or five songs and I sent several of my favorite ones to him and got word back right away like, oh, the album's done, so sorry, you know? <laughs> we Almost like, I should have mentioned this, you know? <laughs> we don't need it, you know, we don't need any songs. But then when I listened to those songs that I had written with Liam in mind, I, I kind of realized that they were actually, they sounded more like Semisonic than they sounded like Liam Gallagher. I had kind of accidentally gotten into that late 90s, you know, guitar mood, thinking I was writing for someone else. And maybe that took the pressure off. I, you know, I sort of, I found the revisiting Semisonic to be pressure filled and sending cool things to Liam Gallagher, Gallagher to be just fun, so. So you've had this revelation that these are Semisonic songs and meanwhile, your bandmates have been sitting there for 19 years and they're probably, well, it's, at this point, it's probably more like 16 or 17 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a pattern established that there are not going to be new songs coming, right? <laughs> right. So it's like, right. how did you feel bringing this new material to the guys? Yeah, that, it's funny because um, John and Jake are really picky uh, in, a, in a good way. They're, they have really good taste. And they're, they know me so well, so they're just not really impressed by me, you know? So uh, I was nervous because I, I wanted to, I sent them this first batch nervously because I, I wanted them to, to like them, but I also wanted to, to see if they felt the same sense that, oh wait, this could be us, you know, this could be songs for us. And um, they, to my like relief, they were, they were both super into the songs. And also, um, even though we ended up not using any of those songs on the EP, uh, th I think they were basically like, whatever, Dan, just <laughs> write anything. Let's just do this. What's wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, it might have been sort of this massive overthink that I did, but I, I don't know. I just want it to be really good. I don't want, I feel like singing in my sleep and closing time and um, delicious and, you know, I'll feel for you and, 
Secret Smile. Uh, these are songs that are like, to me, the, those semi-sonic songs are, are really good. And um, and I, I didn't just want to write any old songs and just, you know, like, I mean, I suppose I had every right to do that if I want to, but I just wanted them to be as good or, you know, at least compete with those songs. So it took time. You know, the title track, You're Not Alone, sounds like it was written for like this month, but actually written about two or three years ago. Yeah. It's just that those feelings have just gotten bigger and bigger for everybody. Yeah, I think, think, think I mean, obviously some, some things have changed for, um, dramatically and for certain people, of course, this has been a cataclysm, but um, the that feeling of dread and isolation and like, what are we gonna do has been on a lot of people's minds. Like this hasn't just been the last six months, you know? So I think if I was writing, you're not alone in 2017 and we were recording it the next year, you know, I think we felt it was very um, timely then. Yeah. You were inspired at least partly by old Dylan records on that track? Oh my goodness. Well, um, Dylan, I discovered Dylan on my own when I was 12 or 13, uh, reading books. Uh, my family spent summers up in the um, uh, northern Minnesota lake land. And uh, we, there was a, a public library and we'd go to the public library and I would take out a book. And I, and I once I had um, exhausted the books about the Beatles. And I then I because I was I think I was already like a music fanatic. And so I read all the books, they had like four books about the Beatles. And I read those. And then they had a couple of books about Bob Dylan. And I learned about Bob Dylan before I listened to the music, even though I had I had heard you know, a couple songs at that time. Um, but I just got so fascinated by Bob Dylan. And so when I went back to Minneapolis each year, um, one of the things the Minneapolis Public Library had was a, a collection of Bob Dylan records. They had a piano you could sign up to play. Wow. So I'd take the bus downtown. I'd sign up for the next available slot to play the piano, which would might be an hour from now or an hour and a half from now. <clears throat> and then I'd read um, the books that I might find about artists, but usually I'd go to the, 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 um, these booths where you could listen to records and I'd listen to Bob Dylan records. And so I learned, I'd learned about Bob Dylan and then I'd look up at the clock and my time on the piano was there. So I'd go over to the, the, the soundproof room and play the piano for 30 minutes. That's great. And I learned about Dylan. And so Dylan is like, a, like a, my <clears throat> North Star, you know, musically. You know, it's like you, you've talked about another song on the record um, being, you know, um, all it would take being right on the edge of what you're comfortable with in terms of, you know, I think the word that you, you the word you used was preachy. Right. Yeah. I, well, I, I don't know if I'm, I, I mean, some songs, there are great songs out there that you could call preachy, but I, I'm not sure if I like any of them. Um, I, and even the Dylan songs that I like the best feel more like, um, either funny or they're just personal stories about some crazy thing that happened or they're just wild uh, images that are imaginary, you know, and, I, and, and sort of probably metaphors for stuff that's really happening. But <clears throat> all it would take is, I wrote it after I saw that movie called He Named Me Malala, which is about the, the Afghani uh, women's rights activist and, and, and um, girls education activist. Um, whose name is Malala, obviously. And, and uh, that movie was so inspiring. And so I, I basically took a chance and wrote a song that, that possibly might turn out to sound preachy. But because I wrote it about the experience of being inspired by someone else, you know, I think at least it doesn't have that quality that I dislike, which is a song that tries to tell you what to do or how to behave. Or I don't want to be told how, how, to, how to live by a song. That's of no interest to me. So I don't think that anything has been officially announced, but is there a new full length semi-sonic uh, album lurking in the wings? Well, if there is, it's half of it's lurking in my uh, imagination because I, I haven't, um, I think we have four really good 
new finished songs uh, that we could add to the EP if we wanted to put that together and make an album, but that's pretty slim. And so I think I'm probably 10 songs short. So uh, I, I need to probably do a bunch of writing in the next couple of months. Because I, 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 our plan, you probably can guess, uh, we were gonna put out the record this year. We had not a year's worth of touring planned, but we had a bunch of touring planned. And you know, UK shows and shows all around the US. And we were really excited to be able to high five everybody you know, uh, in America. And uh, now this, um, you know, uh, pandemic has changed everything, of course. And uh, I still want to get out on tour with the band, and, but I'm kind of envisioning that that's going to, that seems more imaginable in fall of 21, I guess. And which case, probably we need a new EP anyway. <laughs> so I'll have to do that, and that'll be fun. Now that we've unleashed you know <laughs> my inner liam one now that we've unleashed you on yourself <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah we've got semi-sonic back well yeah. uh and of course uh dan has uh not slowed down on his solo work either you can find his music on his website uh, and again the new ep you're not alone is available now and uh, is definitely worth your time and it, it's just so nice of you to give us your time to talk about this new project today, Dan. Uh, it's lovely and- Thank you, John. Yeah. I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm really happy that people are digging it. I'm, I'm sort of amazed in a way that my, my um, I re we really did it in our bubble. We didn't really think about what was gonna happen or if people would listen to it. But if I were forced at that time to say, what would you like to happen? I, I would have named some very, very minimal, like modest hopes for it just not to be embarrassed, you know, uh, when it came out. And then we're, we're well beyond that now. Like lots of people are hearing the music and I'm, I'm sort of stunned. So I, I'm, I, I'm pretty pleased. Yeah. All right. It's been great. And it's a wonderful EP. You're not alone. New music from Semisonic, our guest today on The Bridge. Dan Wilson again. Thank you so much. Thank you. A pleasure.